Good morning, St. James. I hope you're doing well. I'm coming to you this morning from Lake Champlain in Vermont. I figured before I head home uh, in the morning that I'd bring you here. So welcome. A few announcements. One, uh, if you're watching this early, uh, know that you are invited. Uh, you can RSVP from the weekly email, but you are invited uh, to Scott and Helen Christians uh, outside. We will have our outdoor worship this morning. And then uh, our next worship outdoors will probably be the Sunday after Labor Day, uh, but we'll, we'll get you all those details. Uh, we won't be gathering in person on Labor Day as the diocese is putting together a special service. I also want to thank all of you for taking on uh, the backpacks. Uh, we have given out all 40 uh, backpacks and they have been returned and we are very, very grateful to all of you uh, for providing a great start to, uh, to those students that need it. So thank you very, very much. Uh, also in the life of the church, I, uh, I don't have a whole lot to report, uh, but I do want you to know that conversations are taking place about uh, when we be able to reopen, about uh, what that might look like, about safe ways that we might possibly be, be able to uh, uh, partake of communion. And so all those conversations uh, are taking place and, and we do hope that we were able to start the fall with, uh, with, with a regathering of sorts. So uh, in the meantime, we are very grateful to, uh, to the Timberlakes and uh, to the Christians for opening up their households. But, uh, but we are trying to, to regather together as soon as we can. And with that, we begin our worship. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. While we miss seeing everyone in person, we are so grateful for the opportunity to worship with our St. James family today. Stay safe. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Grant, O merciful God, that your church, being gathered together in unity by your Holy Spirit, may show forth your power among all peoples to the glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. The prayers of the people. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for this gathering and for all ministers and people. Pray for the church, especially for Michael, our presiding bishop, Susan, Jennifer, and Porter, our bishops, Ben, and Ted, our clergy. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people especially for Donald, our President, the Congress, and the Supreme Court of the United States. We pray also for those in law enforcement, for their safety, their morale, and that they know the support and gratitude of the communities they serve. We pray for those in the armed forces, their families, and all deployed in harm's way, especially Mark. I ask your prayers for all those who have suffered or feared discrimination, mistreatment or violence because of their God-given identity. Help us to understand, to acknowledge our corporate responsibility, and guide us towards sustained healing, reconciliation, and unity. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, the lonely, the burdened, the anxious, and those in prison. Pray for those in any need or trouble, especially for Patty, Keith, Karen, Judy, Helen, Carol, Bonnie, Omni, Christine, Steve, Judy, Joan, Kay, Ansel, Tina, Linda, Fred, Kay, Ed, Barbara, Ann, Marilee, Marie, and for those whom we now name either silently or aloud. I ask your prayers for all health care and emergency workers, those who continue to put themselves at an increased risk to provide essential services, and those facing economic insecurity as a result of COVID-19. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of God. Pray that they may find 
and be found by God. I ask your prayers for St. James Episcopal Church and School, our Stephen ministers and their care partners. I ask your prayers for the departed. Pray for those who have died, especially any whom we now name either silently or aloud. I ask your prayers for the peace and unity of the Church of God, for the faithful growing relationship between First Baptist Church and St. James Episcopal Church. We give thanks for our many blessings, which we now name either silently or aloud. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. From wherever we find ourselves, we offer our prayers to you, the God who promises to abide with us. During this time, may we know and trust your presence in our lives. Continue to bind us together, embolden us as your church to be signs and agents of your hope, your healing, and your love. We pray this in the name of your Son, who came and dwelt among us, Jesus our Lord. Amen. A reading from Matthew. When Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do you say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some said John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. The word of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So Jesus says to his friend Simon, you will be named Peter, Petros, which means rock. And then this morning we hear Jesus say to Peter, who finally got the answer right after getting so many things wrong, who do they say that I am? The anointed one, the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus says, you will be my rock. You will be the foundation, the rock upon which I build my church. You will be the rock. I've been thinking a lot about that, largely because I'm here surrounded by rock and because this has been my touchstone, my constant from where I've jumped off, tried new things, grown, a place I could return I've talked a lot about it, so I figured since we're doing virtual worship, this wouldn't be a bad time to show you a little bit about this place that means so much to me. But I've also talked about the fact that moving around every two to three years, sometimes just one year, that I didn't have a lot of constants. That the two places that I could count on were the Episcopal Church, which changed from architectural style, congregations, windows, where we sat, although it usually was the front pew. But I could count on the ritual being fairly constant and this place, this place just north of Burlington, Vermont, where my family's been for hundreds of years. And I thought about the security you get from being around your touchstone. Thought about 
what a foundation it is to have a place you can come back to, a place where you know who you are, where you know that you are loved, where you know you're surrounded by family, where you can mess up and people pick you up and brush you off again, where you can bring your fears, your joys, your anxieties. It's been a place where we've been able to grieve together the tragedies in our lives or the expected losses, the loss of patriarchs and matriarchs. We've held rituals. We've celebrated new birth. You know, it sounds a lot like the church. Peter was given this responsibility to be that rock, to be that foundation. You know, our rock's been tilted a little bit. We can't gather for worship in the same way, but that touchstone still remains. The church still exists as a place for us to hold each other up for us to know that we stand on a sure foundation, for us to jump off confident that we can go in new places and try new things. I figured I'd show you a few of those rocks here today as I take a little ride around this lake that's been my home for, well, well before I was born. So join me. You head out between those two land masses out of the bay into the larger lake, heading towards New York State, you'll come across some islands. Almost a couple of centuries ago, my family had a quarry on one of those islands that produced black granite. That rock adorns Radio City Music Hall, the National Art Museum in DC, and the state capitol here in Vermont. That's part of my story. So this rock is the rock we often use when we're having conversations about how high the water is or how low the water is. When people first get up here at the very beginning of summer or late spring, they often will tell us that that rock is under the water. You can't even see it. And by the end of summer, uh, much like we are now, people would say the rock is entirely out of the water. It's also an easy place for children to slide into the water for the first time when they're just learning how to swim. So this is the point or the diving rock. In the early years, you start off jumping in over there and you build up the courage until you can leap from right up in there. Uh, the second half of life I've found has been watching my children do the same. And uh, from the experience of my parents, the third is increased trepidation around jumping from any of these rocks. But, uh, but it's been an important measure. Often you see on Facebook where the kids come up and the first thing they do is jump off that big rock. And these rocks over to the side, they call that terbithia, and it's where they let their imagination grow as they ground rock into magic dust and uh, just spend hours in their own imagination. And if we went around the point further, we would come to a place where I learned how to cast a fishing rod. It's a work still in progress. These are some of the rocks that have defined my childhood and the childhood of my children and hopefully of their children. We didn't read the story today, but the assigned reading is the story of Moses and the bulrushes. I picture a place like this being Moses's touchstone, the place he comes back to to remind himself who he is, his origin story. From this place, I think he would be keenly aware that God is certainly in his life directing him, that God has sent people into his life, like Shifra and Pua, to keep him safe, the courageous midwives, or his sister, or his mother. This place serves as a reminder that God will watch over him, that God has big dreams for him, that God has big dreams for his people. I imagine as he came here, he also realized that he lives in the complexity of two worlds. The world where the kindness of Pharaoh's daughter adopted him into, and the life upon which he was born, to slave people. I imagine every time he came here, he realized 
the complexity of his life, the beauty of his life, and that both worlds would call to him. It's important to have places that you can go to remind you whose you are, what your story is, where God is in your life, and the people that God has sent into your life. Just as Moses revisited that story again and again, even if it predated his ability to hold on to memories, it defined him so fully that that moment was galvanized into his being, his identity. Peter was equally galvanized by the, that memory that we share today, that moment where he realized not just that he was called, as he had already been called, not just that he was equipped, probably mostly, that he was trusted, that Jesus trusted him, that Jesus said, on this rock I will build my church. Peter, I trust you. I bet Peter knew everyone that was gathered around. I bet he's never forgotten any of the moments, the details, of that origin story where he was called, and not just called, but trusted where he was given the responsibility of being the father of the church. One of the things that makes this season in our lives so difficult is that one of our chief touchstones, one of the places where we most fully know who we are is the church. The church has been there for us when we go through those milestones in life, new birth, baptism, marriage, death, where we lift each other up when we're going through an unfortunate diagnosis, or we've gotten bad news, or we've had a break in an important relationship in our lives. The church is our north. It's the place where we know that God is working in our lives most fully. But I can tell you, it's not relegated to a place. It is difficult. It is difficult not being able to go to that place. And I pray that that season will soon come to an end, but it isn't just the place. The church, that touchstone, the place where we know that we are equipped, where we know that God is guiding us, strengthening us, fortifying us, where we're surrounded by people that reflect God's presence in our lives. That's not relegated to behind those red doors. I imagine that God is saying to each of us, on this rock, I will build my church. You, my friends, you, my sisters and brothers, you are the rock. You are the church. When we can gather Inside those red doors, you will be the church. You will be the touchstone. And when we can't, you are the church. You are the touchstone. You are trusted by God for the work that you are set apart to do. So be the church. Be it boldly. And know that that rock is in you, is with you. That you are Petros, the rock on which I will build my church. Amen.
Remember that life is short, and we have too little time to gladden the hearts of those who traveled away with us. So be quick to be kind, make haste to love, and may the blessing of God Almighty, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, be upon you and remain with you always. Our worship is now ended, and our service in the world begins. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Miss you, St. James.